Hello, everyone, and welcome to Iowa In-Depth Week for the Gazette's Iowa Ideas 2023. This week's focus is on the urban-rural divide, and the name of today's session is Creative Workforce Solutions for Urban and Rural Communities. Uh, before we get started, I want to take this opportunity to thank our sponsor, Iowa Ideas, presenting sponsor, ITC Midwest. Hello, everyone. My name is Aaron Murphy. I am the Des Moines Bureau Chief for the Gazette, and I'll be moderating today's panel discussion. We have a couple of great panelists today, each with their unique expertise that they will bring to this discussion, and we thank them very much for being here. And I'll let them introduce themselves, tell us a little about their organization and, and what it is they do. So let's start with Cassandra Hecker. Thank you for being here, Cassandra. Thanks for having me. Uh, so I work for student manufacturing. I'm an HR generalist for the company. I've been with them a little over three years now. I actually live just outside of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, so I am not in the great state of Iowa currently. Um, but my job mostly focused primarily on recruiting and just bringing different ideas to the table with the company there. So happy to talk today. So Cassandra, you're not having to deal with the Iowa heat uh, right now. I right? am not. Oh, it is a very rainy week in Pennsylvania, so I think you would rather switch with me. <laughs> yeah, we're all we're all jealous here. Uh, and we also have with us Aaron Melanix. Uh, Aaron, tell us about yourself. Yeah, so I am the research director for the Iowa League of Cities, and I am also in a shared role with Iowa State Extension's Office of Community and Economic Development. And the league is kind of, we hope to be a one-stop shop for training, education, advocacy for city governments in the state of Iowa. All right, excellent. So uh, as, as you've heard, we have uh, someone here from the private sector and someone from the public sector. So it should help us have a great discussion today. Uh, I wanna remind you all listening, first of all, thank you very much for being here with us. We're thrilled to have you. And audience rem members, we wanna remind you can submit questions throughout today's discussion if you'd like. Uh, so place them in the chat and, and our host will pass them along to us. And if we have time towards the end of our discussion today, we'll get to some of those. Uh, I did a panel on Tuesday and we had some great questions from uh, the listeners. So hopefully we get a few at, here today as well. Um, so let me just get a, a, a started here today by getting kind of the lay of the land and talk to both of you, Aaron and Cassandra, uh, about the workforce challenges that are facing your, your different uh, industries. And as Cassandra, we'll start with you. Um, and I know that coming out of the COVID-19 pandemic, workforce shortages uh, have been an issue across all sectors and in all areas of the country, not just in Iowa. Uh, the workforce data does seem to be improving. Um, in fact, recent state data showed that workforce participation has climbed back above pre-pandemic levels for the first time. So that would seem to be a good thing. Um, on the other hand, just this morning, I, I saw new data that shows Iowa's percentage of the population in the workforce, while, while better than most states, has not yet rebounded to pre-pandemic levels by that metric. So, so just to help us, Cassandra, from your vantage point, how are things out there right now? Do companies have enough workers or, or, or is that still a need? You know, it really depends on the day, you know. Um, I think what we're seeing now is the students that are now entering the workforce, the years that COVID hit them were really these critical years of when employers would have been coming and talking to them, when, you know, they would have been figuring out, hey, what is sparking my interest? What's driving me to want to do stuff? Maybe they're seeing mom and dad are working from home and that's what they want to do. And they're not realizing that, hey, you got to put in you know, the nitty gritty part of the job to get to that point where you are able to work from home. So we had a two to three year gap there where employers weren't going into schools. We weren't allowed, you know, kids really are coming out of school going, I don't know what I want to do. And it's really starting to show. And another thing, even, you know, on the social side of it too, they're, uh, they're not having the interactions that they did before. They're not, getting exposed to not only just employers, but the jobs. They weren't able to do those jobs because the pandemic had shut down the restaurants and shut down the fast food chain. So they didn't have that work experience early on. And they thought, well, I got by without doing it, you know, so far. So why am I going to go do it now? Um, 
and companies all over, we're still producing at higher levels than we were pre-pandemic. So our orders are still up. The demand is still up. The economy, you know, on some regards is still booming in that aspect. So we need more employer, employees now than we ever have. Yes. And so that's interesting. If I could just kind of ask you to expand a little bit on that. And I, I've, I've covered this topic a little bit, uh, but maybe not as much as uh, some other reporters who have a uh, more business specific beat. And, and this is uh, um, the, what I heard from you uh, sounded a lot like uh, some of the bigger challenges in this area have been with the younger people, the, the, like you said, the, the, the young uh, people just coming out of college. Is that in, in your, um, am, am I given a fair synopsis there that you feel like that that's been primarily where the issue in workforce shortages? Has yeah, I mean, younger the workers? younger generation isn't filling those gaps as the older generation exits the workforce, and the older generation is exiting at very unprecedented levels than ever before. You know, COVID kind of made people realize what was important, too. Um, so people that might have been on the fence of retiring suddenly did, or they might have been forced into retirement due to child care issues for, you know, their grown children to take care of grandchildren. I saw that happen a lot where, you know, the daughter or the son has to go to work. So, hey, grandma and grandpa is going to retire to watch the kids now. So it it affected just so much. And it's crazy that we're over three years out from when COVID-19 was at its height and we're still able to say, hey, it's COVID, it's COVID. It kind of really gets under your skin, but it it is. It's just, you know, it's something that we never prepared for and uh, it's just still affecting us. Yeah, and has it started? Are you seeing any encouraging signs yet or are we still kind of uh, trying to get some of those people back into the workforce? I think everybody just wants it to be normal. Nobody wants to talk about COVID anymore. Um, you know, whenever we go to colleges now, we're with classes that, you know, we're at that junior level, so they weren't really affected uh, by COVID. You know, you had these seniors now that are graduating college that were seniors in high school when they shut down the schools. So they missed out on all all those senior things that kind of wrap up that whole chapter of your life. And then you go into college where you're in this remote setting, employers aren't able to come in, you're not able to go tour something. I could vividly remember during my college days going and touring a factory and seeing a robot and being like, wow, you know, and they never got those experiences. So it's just sad to see that happening. So yeah. But I think as time moves on, we'll see those effects less and less. We're now like uh, here at Sukup, we're able to bring students back in for tours, which is great. We've been doing that for a while. So hopefully now those waves will start, you know, uh, trickling through, but it's going to take some time. Yeah. Yeah. And and uh, keep it in mind, our, our topic today, Cassandra, these issues that you described the last few years and, and still sort of continuing now. Did that hit urban and rural communities differently, or has it kind of been broadly the same impact? Yeah, I would say definitely. I, I'm very fortunate that I got to see it on both ends. Um, at that time when the pe- pandemic first started, uh, we had a factory out here in Pennsylvania with Sukup. So, I mean, it hit us so hard, and we had different things that shut us down. Like, we had to shut down completely. So that was a whole different ball game. I had um, ample amounts of people before, and then everything died down. People really, you know, had to think of what their priorities were with COVID. And then moving into the rural side, um, I still say that Iowans are some of the hardest people I've ever known, but you're getting tired. They're tired of being the backbone. They're tired of being the ones that go out every single day, 10 hour days, while other people don't have to do that. Um, They're tired of being on the factory floor versus, you know, working from home or being in an office setting. So um, I'm definitely seeing that be a trend now, too, where people, you know, are definitely getting worn out from being the backbone of America for three years. All right. And and Aaron, let's bring you in now. Um, Obviously, your expertise is in the public sector. So uh, let me ask you, did the pandemic induced workforce shortage impact cities and local governments? Also, and, and uh, if it did, I'm assuming it did. Um, if it did, has that rebounded recently, similarly to the ways it has 
uh, to some degree in the private sector. It definitely impacted communities. Um, that's that's for sure, and it has impacted some really key roles. So if we take a look at some of the examples um, in a community, in a city, we might be talking about a city clerk. If you turned over your city clerk position, um, then you may have a really difficult time recruiting someone with a budget or finance background to help fill that position. We've heard from communities that finding certified and trained water, wastewater treatment um, operators is really hard to keep our water quality um, as it should be and as expected. Uh, seasonal employment roles have been a big challenge the last couple of summers. So we're talking about golf courses and swimming pools and um, really competing to get lifeguards. So some of the metro area communities are talking about how they've had to um, cut hours at some of their aquatic facilities. They've had to rotate um, on a weekly basis because they just have shortages of, of lifeguards to keep those roles going. Um, and I would be remiss if I didn't mention public safety. And that's the whole public safety umbrella, police, uh, fire, volunteer, EMS. And kind of an important thing to bring up there would be just emergency response times that are um, so dependent upon being able to staff and have those, those positions um, staffed where they need to be. I, I know I certainly want them at my door if I ever need them. Um, and so th there's kind of a dual issue there of a, a critical need, but also a, really a crit critical shortage of, of folks to fill those roles. And, and so it, and it's not just cities. I mean, if we broaden it out to the public sector, talking about counties and state government and schools, I mean, there's teacher shortages for sure. Um, most any position in school seems like there's a shortage there. Corrections facilities, child and family services, mental health services, just as a few examples. So it's it's definitely a shortage. Um, and, and I feel like for local government, we're kind of lagging behind the recovery um, that you mentioned in, in some of the uh, private sector. Yeah, interesting. And uh, you mentioned something that's a, a great note because um, I mentioned the I was involved in another panel on uh, Tuesday, and one of the things we talked about in, in that is, is maintaining services, and we had a guest, Mike Kennan, who is the emergency services coordinator for Cass County, and he talked exactly about uh, the issue you just described, Aaron, and, and the need for uh, people uh, working, you know, in, as uh, emergency responders, EMS, uh, ambulance drivers, et cetera, et cetera, and, and, and how they're facing those shortages do and, and what that means, which is exactly what you touched on there. And so that's a great one and, and a great way for me to uh, let folks know that uh, all these sessions are being recorded and uh, you can find them. Uh, it, they'll eventually be archived and, and put on the Iowa Ideas website. Uh, so definitely, uh, if you missed that one on Tuesday, it was a great discussion. Check that out. And, and this one eventually will be to um, so okay, Aaron, you gave us the lay of the land there. Similarly, I want, to what I asked uh, Cassandra, did have you seen? Have you found that these issues that you described are they hitting the, the the metro areas versus the smaller rural communities differently? Is 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 one getting hit harder than the other, or maybe just differently? What have you seen there? Yeah, that's a great question. I would say both urban and rural communities are facing similar issues as far as shortages generally. Um, some of that looks maybe a little bit different uh, because urban and rural communities are all competing really against each other for these difficult to fill positions. Uh, a lot of times urban centers or urban communities are able to maybe pay a little bit more um, uh, for wages and so they may take from rural and so they're that'll create kind of a rural shortage. But at the same time, some of the urban communities need to fill more positions. And so that adds to their, their recruiting. And I know you mentioned the unemployment statistics lately. And so if we kind of compare, we know that Iowa is not the only place that's um, experiencing these shortages. So not only are we competing with our neighboring communities and kind of doing the urban and rural uh, competition for, for workers, but we're also competing with 
um, neighboring states and uh, Midwest regional communities and, and, and trying to fill some of these really hard to fill roles as well. Yeah. All right. So, so thank you both for that. So now we have sort of the lay of the land. Let's talk about, as our session is titled, uh, Creative Workforce Solutions for Urban and Rural Communities. Um, and, and Aaron, let's start with you this time. Um, so we're, I guess we're thinking about recruitment or, or, or maybe retention to some degree, whatever it might be. Are there Iowa local governments that you're aware of out there that are, have been trying new or unique things to try to address these workforce issues that, that we just heard about? Yeah, I think they have to. They're certainly trying. Um, but some of the some of the things that that I've been hearing um, are the partnerships that they've established, um, sometimes with industry, uh, with uh, higher education or community college networks, um, and looking at tech technical programs uh, and apprenticeships. I've been hearing that apprenticeship programs are pretty strong here in Iowa. So um, so so that's one area that they might look to to help fill some of those roles. Uh, and again, you touched on before, uh, looking to try to fill some of these positions with uh, younger populations. And so that might look like having local governments get out to those career fairs um, where younger folks or um, folks that are looking for, for jobs are to educate what, what do the jobs look like. Um, and, and then possibly using social I think we need to be using social media responsibly in local government, of course, but um, probably some of the younger populations are using some social media platforms that I am not on. <laughs> so, um, so those would be a few ideas. I, th I think we also need to um, continue. Our communities are looking at their quality of life amenities. Do they have affordable housing to be able to support recruitment of more workers to fill these roles? Do they have um, child care, access to child care um, and um, schools and transportation and, and all of that in our community that kind of contributes to that? And then also looking at what does remote work look like? Um, and, and that kind of creates a whole new lens as we look at emerging technologies and other new roles that we may be looking to fill as well. Yeah, and I definitely want to have us talk about that too. So we're definitely going to circle back on, on that, the idea of remote work. Um, uh, just real quick, Aaron, uh, as kind of a follow-up there, uh, it would, is it historically and regardless even of the, of the pandemic, and maybe that also magnified things one way or the other, but is it, is it historically been challenging to recruit workers um, into the public sector? You know, is there um, uh, a sort of, uh, you know, a, 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 an opinion maybe of, of government out there that, that sometimes you have to break through with people to get them excited about or interested in working, you know, for their local or county government? Well, that's a great question. I'm not sure if I could speak well to that. I, you know, historically, it's been, um, you know, we look at positions that, you know, have a, a public pension program attached and kind of incentivize um, some of those roles. And I think now we really need to look at an awareness of what, what types of jobs are out there um, in local government and getting into the schools and educating on what does it mean to work for a city? Uh, what types of roles are there? And so that's maybe a different look at um, recruiting or, or talking about the workforce pipeline than, than we've had in the past for that. All right, excellent. Uh, Cassandra, let, let's go to you now. Uh, what have Iowa, uh, I'm sorry, what have Iowa businesses uh, been doing to get people back into the, into the workforce? What have been sort of the new or, or creative solutions that uh, uh, companies have been trying, starting maybe with Scoop Up or any others that you're aware of? Yeah, I, you know, this kind of does piggyback off the government a little bit. Um, like Aaron said, the partnerships. Uh, recently, Iowa did that child care grant for child care centers. So that's been a big motivator for us, um, you know, looking into daycare options for our employees because, you know, employees can't come to work if they have kids at home. So that's, you know, at the end of the day, <laughs> you gotta have child care. Um, but overall companies, it's crazy to me how much from the HR perspective, um, there used to just be such a heavy focus on benefit packages, like what your health insurance looks like, you know, what does my retirement look like, 401k, stuff like that. 
And then again, there's a shift with this younger generation where, hey, I'm on mom and dad's insurance until I'm 26 now. So you have this uh, 18 to 26 year old gap where they don't care about insurance. And that's a big, uh, you know, chunk of our workforce is that 18 to 26 year old. So we had to look at our compensation packages and say, okay, like we used to start people at this rate because we paid this much for insurance and blah, blah, blah. But we have so many of these younger employees that aren't even benefiting from the insurance because they don't need it. So that really, we've had a lot of conversations surrounding that. Um, and I, I think that's something too, that employers, when we get to go and talk to students to make them realize how important that insurance package is. And when I'm talking to that employee, that's like, oh, I'm on my parents. I'm like, well, you know, you're probably costing them money if you don't have a sibling. So why don't we really actually look at this and go talk to your parents and see if they still want you on it or not, you know? Um, so I think that's been a big hurdle that we're working through is, these young kids, they don't need the insurance. I mean, 26 is a completely different time frame than what it used to be. It used to be 18 unless you were in college and then 21 and, you know, you could get by then. But, you know, 26, you're well into your adult career at that point. Yeah. Um, I, I want to follow up on, on this idea because um, uh, 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 we've heard a lot about uh, the partnerships with the, with the uh, community colleges, even high schools. Um, and, and we heard a lot about that uh, in my session on Tuesday as well from those folks. Uh, Cassandra, do, do you have, that, that must be a, a really valuable way for, for businesses uh, and, and other entities that, to, to engage with young people and get them interested in thinking about that? Because I hear it so often. Could you expand on that a little bit? Just tell me, and, and maybe you have uh, some kind of anecdotal um, evidence or, or, or story, but, but, you know, how, how valuable are those kinds of uh, contacts and partnerships to, to, with those entities to, to be talking with young people and getting them thinking about these things at an early age? Yeah, I mean, it's honestly, it's make or break. Um, you know, these kids will grow up their whole life thinking, I don't want to go work in a factory, because it's dirty, it's dingy, it's this and it's that. And we'll bring a group of junior high school kids in and they're like, wow, you know, and I'm sure other facilities have that same thing going on where it's not, you know, the dark, dingy factory that it was in the 1940s. You know, we have robots, we're up to date, it's well lit, it's, you know, high tech that um, just getting the kids in early on, they have that experience where, you know, it, they just need one thing to spark their interest. And the apprenticeships that Iowa is uh, starting to approve and let them do, it used to be so limited. They couldn't do this, they couldn't do that. And now we're seeing those, you, you know, those limitations fall off in some regard. There's still quite a bit they can't do, but I can at least have them on the floor where before it was more office-based. So I'm able to get them out there and let them see the product from start to finish versus just seeing it on a screen or on a video. Um, but if the schools didn't work with us, uh, it would it would just crush everything. So being able to even reach out to NIAC, um, I just did the other day for computer graduates. So those partnerships are just critical to our uh, flow of candidates. Yeah, and, and, and Aaron, I'll just give you, you don't have to, but I'll give you the opportunity. To, is that, have you seen similar evidence that, um, with getting, you know, talking to young people about, uh, local government, and you, and you touched on this already a little bit, but that, that you know, can be an informative or, or eye-opening um, experience for young people? Oh, I think absolutely. Um, anytime that we can talk to folks about some of the exciting jobs that we can offer, and the, the league does a annual, if I were a mayor, essay contest, um, and it's really fun. It's one of my favorite projects every year, that we get, I, I think they're middle schoolers that fill, that do an essay um, and they relate it to their community, but it makes them kind of think about what are these roles and you just get to read about their perspectives on how government operates. And I think that's always a really fun thing to do, but it's also important to kind of the awareness piece of, of these jobs um, that they're maybe not what they 
what springs to mind when they're thinking about their city and they probably don't really think every day about the services that a city um, provides. And so it gives them the opportunity when we connect uh, with high school or uh, K-12 and then and then beyond that in technical colleges and higher education and um, help them understand what, what things that we can do. And then even some of the newer things that cities are starting to participate in. I've been um, a part of the Iowa Automated uh, Transportation Council and we've been talking about automated vehicles and how do we think about the infrastructure that's gonna be needed in our communities to serve autonomous vehicles going forward or policies around that. And you don't necessarily think about that right away about local government, but it's also an important topic. So there's a lot of new emerging discussions in that in that area. All right, excellent. Um, before we move on to the next topic, just want to take an opportunity. We're um, just a, a shade under halfway through our discussion today. It's been great so far. Um, reminder to everybody listening in case maybe you weren't in right at the top. Um, first of all, again, thank you for being here. And uh, all of our listeners have the opportunity to ask a question if they'd like. So if you do have a question for one of our panelists uh, on this topic, put it in the chat and uh, our event host will get that to me. And then if we have time at the end of today's discussion, uh, we'll get to those questions. Uh, so if there's anything on your mind on this topic about uh, workforce solutions uh, in urban and rural communities in Iowa. Please put that in the chat. Uh, so this is uh, something um, that has been touched on already. And I mentioned I wanted to come back to it. And Cassandra, we'll start with you here. Uh, the idea of, of working remotely. So that was one of the thing, things that uh, maybe a silver lining of the pandemic, that there was a lot more discussion about remote work. And it seemed like businesses became more idea and, and welcoming to the idea of, uh, of having workers work remotely. And, and that, you know, theoretically means that a business can be housed in a, in a urban uh, metro area, but it can have workers anywhere uh, in the state or I, I guess even the, in the country, theoretically. Um, has that it, it, from your vantage point, from what you've seen, uh, has that happened? Have you seen that playing out in Iowa? Do we see people able to move and live in, in rural communities while working for companies that may be based elsewhere? And, 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 I, and maybe what are still some hurdles to that? Yeah, it's definitely not only hurt us, but it's helped us too. So we're seeing people that live in our towns, our rural Iowa towns, going and working remotely for those bigger corporations, which, you know, is good for them, but bad for us. And then we're also seeing people that are like me that are in a metro area that are working for these smaller companies. So it, it's a very odd dynamic again of COVID. I never thought in a million years I would A, work remote or B, work for a company located in Iowa. So um, it definitely shifted a lot. Um, another thing though, it's making our you know, our managers, when I post a job that I'm like, hey, are you open to this being remote? They might give me a side, but they're like, okay, we'll see what we can get. So for like those engineering and design positions, as much as we want them to be on site and, you know, right out the door from our factory, we're realizing we're definitely getting a way bigger pull when we open that up to the masses of being remote. Um, another thing that we've done that's really combated this, uh, we opened an office space in Ames, so a way bigger area that now we're able to hire more and they're still in the office and they're able to come up to our main campus, you know, frequently because it's an hour drive, which everything is just a straight hour out there, I've realized. <laughs> so, uh, but I think having that creative idea really um, has opened the gates for us on the recruiting side that even though they're remote, they're in Iowa, they're in Ames, they're in our office building, they have that sense of community around them. And there's still an hour drive just to come up to see us, or if there's a big project or an event going on. So um, the space started out really empty. And now we are overfilled and looking to expand. So, uh, you know, and that's just in a year's time of how well that's worked out for us. So so, so you are so that is 
that has been happening then it sounds like you see you see in the more and more workers interested in that more and more companies trying as best they can anyways to embrace yeah, it you know no idea at this point is off the table that we had a very tiny space in Ames. We said, let's really try to fill it up, see what applicants we could get. And, uh, you know, I got a lot of IT and engineers down there when I can't get them to come all the way up to Sheffield five days a week. So we definitely took what we can get. The engineering team at first was like, oh, how's this going to work when we have a problem and we got to tinker through it, you know, stuff like this. But they're kind of having their own problems down there that they tinker on. And then the Sheffield crew has their, you know, other ones that they do. So everybody's just kind of adapting and rolling with the punches as they come. So. Yeah. Interesting. And Aaron to you, I suppose this is a little different for to you because I, I presume that most local governments and most cities and counties like to have their people living if not right there, at least pretty close. So, so maybe this isn't as much an option in, in the private sector, but, but I'll let you uh, tell me that. Mm-hmm. Or, or maybe is it more of a question of, um, you know, this, uh, this kind of, um, you know, remote working uh, is a little more helpful to rural communities and, 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 and local governments in more rural areas? I, you, you tell me. Yeah, I think it's fair to say that the majority of local government cities um, uh, job positions are in person. Um, I mentioned the uh, critical kind of needs, a few of the roles that are very difficult to fill right now. Uh, we're, we're talking about public safety officers and lifeguards and city clerks. They've got to be there um, in person or out in the field um, doing doing that work. There certainly are some positions, um, and I think that puts local governments in a good position when they do have some positions that could be remote that maybe they could fill a, a specific need uh, for. And I think it's very helpful also for uh, local government to be thinking about, even if it's not their own employees that are working remotely, um, how do they serve the community? How do they promote economic development or community development, um, given that new um, focus on remote work and pr- being able to provide broadband access and those things in their, in their communities as well? Yeah, and, and uh, a couple of things I wanted to follow up on this because they're, uh, they're their own issues in their own right, but they're tangentially uh, related to this and, and to discuss it. And, and one or, and they've maybe even been touched on by both of you already today, but childcare and, and housing. Um, how big of a factor are both of those things in these workforce challenges that you're both seeing? When we're talking about childcare, um, I, I believe Cassandra it was you that, that mentioned this, that you know, as, as that cost continues to increase, that calculation families are going through um, is becoming more and more prevalent of at some point I'm paying more in childcare than I'm, um, I'm getting paid at my job. So it makes more sense to just stay home with my kids and, and, and then in housing, affordable housing and that effect, especially the rural areas, I, you know, workers saying I'd, I'd love to live in a rural community and, and, and have a, either a job there or work remotely, but there's just a lack of housing. Uh, if each of you could talk a little bit about that, Cassandra, we'll start with you. Just how much are child care and housing um, still uh, an issue, a factor in, in this equation of uh, getting more workers into the workforce? Uh, the child care issue, you know, it seems like it climbs every year for some reason. So we've uh, sent out surveys to our employees and pretty close to 40% of them have indicated that at some point in time, they've had difficulty having secure child care. So, um, you know, definitely during the pandemic, we saw it a lot more where, hey, daycare is closed today. I can't come into work. I'm not having that backup. So um, like when the, the Iowa government came out with those child care grants to try to open new centers that partnered with employers, that was huge to us. We jumped right on that. You know, um, hopefully some things are in the works that will definitely change not only employment for us, but our entire community. So I, I think that that's a big step forward, but it doesn't happen overnight. 
Um, and then especially when private uh, daycares close all of a sudden too, well, a lot of people in our town employees, that's where they take their kids. So overnight you can have 10 people without childcare that it's just crazy to me that they'll just close their doors. Hey, nope. After tomorrow, I'm not watching kids anymore. And the wait lists are just, you know, years and years long to get into a different center. Yeah. Uh, and, and, go ahead. No, I'm sorry. I was just going to ask real quick. And, and this is a, uh, so we'll be totally informal here. I should, I sh should have remembered and done my homework so I wouldn't have to ask this <laughs> live, but am, do, am I remembering right? Cassandra, were you on the governor's task, child court, child care task force that was, exploring this issue or am I thinking I wasn't on the child care task force um now okay. I'm on a different side of that but I was on the youth employment task force okay and we're going to talk about that that's what I was thinking of. yeah uh, okay and so I'm sorry you were starting to say something oh yeah but um, when you go into the housing now that's a whole other issue uh where I personally I would move to Iowa tomorrow but as soon as you start putting housing on top of that with uh they call it the golden handcuffs and I think that that's a great term for it. I bought my house pre-pandemic. I, you know, refinanced during the pandemic. I'm at this historically low interest rate with a house that, quite frankly, if it would go on the market today, I wouldn't be able to afford it in today's market. So then you're looking at trying to recruit these people like, hey, come to this rural community. It's great. It's wonderful. And it is. I cry every time that I leave the state of Iowa because I'm like, my heart is here. But then when the realistic side of me comes in and the numbers and the type A person that I am, I realize I, you're stacking all these things against me that I, I can't. And the housing market is 80% of that problem. And when you talk to other people too, you know, it doesn't make sense to move. If you're in at this low interest rate, you bought your house pre-pandemic, quickly your, you know, your 10 to 20 year house just became your forever home. And it's just the weirdest thing shifted that I'm like, oh, if this would have happened in 2019, you know, and then people were telling themselves in 2021, well, I'll just wait, I'll wait because the prices are going to come down. Well, if everybody would have had a crystal ball in 2021, they would have jumped on that because of what's happening now. So it just hit after hit for this housing market and it's affecting even people that want to leave or, you know, buy a bigger house, you know, uh, expand their family, stuff like that. It just really is affecting everything. Yeah. So um, normally a journalist doesn't like to insert themselves into the story, but I can't help myself here, Cassandra, as you just, as you described that uh, your host, your moderator today, uh, bought his home in April of 2020, so you can probably uh, do some math there. Uh, yeah. <laughs> if we and we're happy where we are, we're not necessarily looking to move, but the times we have considered it and done the math, it's. Uh, I, yeah, I, you do yeah. one search on Zillow and you put that phone down. You're like, <laughs> that doesn't nope. take very long. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, child care and housing, Aaron, it, it, is it a similar impact in in the public sector too? And and and, and getting people into the workforce, are those, are those hurdles there as well? I think they're both hurdles there as well. Kind of sticking on the housing for a moment. I think building uh, homes is tr a very tricky uh, thing right now too, with uh, costs uh, for construction materials going up, um, t lengthy time frames to get a house spot, talking with a lot of our rural places, um, they can't get developers to come into rural uh, communities um, as easily as some of the urban places. So there's some struggles there. And just the type of housing that is needed in order to attract workforce, we need a good variety um, to fit that as well. So whether it's apartments, uh, townhomes, single family homes, um, we need to be able to support that in order to have the jobs filled and the people coming uh, to some of our rural places. So that's that's definitely continues to be a challenge. I think child care as well. Um, I know I've heard in our metro area, it's very hard to find child care. So then that's got to mean that it's very difficult in rural places um, to attract folks and be able to have access to child care as well. So um, I think both of those continue to be really big points of struggle. I know on Monday you had um, you had uh, Dr. David Peters on, um, 
for the Iowa Ideas, and he talked about the Rural Smart Shrink Grant um, led out of Iowa State, and it's funded by the National Science Foundation. And I'm also a part of that grant team. And that, as we talk with our rural places and communities that we're piloting um, and learning their struggles, those are two of the top issues that come up every time. Um, and I would add schools uh, to, to that as well as uh, the trend kind of goes towards consolidation. So, you know, access to and um, yeah, transportation to schools, um, child care and uh, affordable housing have been re really big issues for quality of life and attracting workforce. All right. Um, before we move on to our next topic, uh, as we head into the uh, last third of our discussion here today. Uh, again, want to remind folks that are listening that if they'd like to ask a question, to put that in the chat and, and uh, we'll get to, to those if we get a chance here down the home stretch. I think we'll have a, a couple minutes and, and I do see a, a couple questions in there. So we'll get to those. And, and if anybody else has one, feel free to throw that in the chat. Um, so, so Cassandra, you, you reminded me and, and corrected me of which chat you were on. Uh, but I, I wanted to touch on that here to um, the, uh, the state this year, uh, state lawmakers and Governor Reynolds signed into law some changes to the state's um, age regulations for workers and it, and it loosened up those regulations in some ways and uh, made it so a few younger, a few different kinds of younger workers could work certain jobs that they were precluded from before. Uh, I'm, I'm going to... Uh, give a, a just kind of a little uh, caveat here. Um, so my background, I'm a state government reporter, so I covered this in depth during this last session. I am fully aware of how um, passionate this debate was at time over this law, and, and uh, we totally respect that, and everyone is welcome to have their opinions on, on the elements of this law. We're not going to rehash that debate here today. What I'm just uh, curious to hear uh, from you, Cassandra, is uh, whether you view, you know, we're just a couple months in this now, but have you seen any benefits to that yet? Or, and, and or do you think that this is something that could help uh, business address some of these challenges that we've been talking about? We definitely haven't seen any benefits of it yet. Um, employers in general still have a lot of questions regarding what they can and cannot do. Um, so I think, uh, you know, in the next coming months, there'll be better guidelines that come out or maybe a few webinars about what you can and can't do. And again, it's going to take years for these kids that are now able to enter the workforce at 16 or 17 to really see what that does to the workforce overall, to see what they end up going to college for if they decide to go. Um, a lot of students, the biggest fear with this on our side was we didn't want them to go into a job at 16 or 17 and then just be complacent, which if that's what they want to do, that's fine. But we didn't want to have a huge number of kids that are like, hey, I'm here. I'm doing X, Y and Z. I'm fine with this. I'm never leaving. You know, that's kind of an employer's dream on one regard. But then in the other, you know, you want them to further their career and education. So um, I think overall, just the thought process behind this was your seven-year-old kid could have baseball at 7.30 at night, but your 17-year-old kid couldn't work past seven o'clock before. So that was our main motivator in looking into these laws and really seeing what we could change. And the way the old laws were written, uh, a 17-year-old couldn't even use Windex in the workplace. So um, <laughs> it was just time to look into those and get those up to date. Um, they definitely have come a long way. I think there's still some work to do on it, but uh, our goal was not to have a 14 year old down in a coal mine at midnight. So um, I definitely saw that out there on the internet that I'm like, oh, I just need to shut my computer for now because uh, we're going down a wormhole here. But um, I definitely think we'll see some positives. I think it's really great because there is such a gap, even for, you know, like you had said, the lifeguards, Aaron, you know, just those jobs that used to be filled by our young workforce aren't anymore. So hopefully now this opens up avenues and really motivates the youth to get into a career earlier on versus just sitting around and waiting for whatever to happen for them. And Cassandra, I'll give because obviously you're familiar with manufacturing. That was one of the other 
uh, concerns that I heard often when it came to discussion about safety for, for some of these younger workers. Could you just kind of address to that from your, your perspective? Yeah. But, yeah it, it really didn't allow the manufacturing sector to do much more than it was able to do. So, um, you know, when we were looking at the laws at first, I'm like, oh, why am I even doing this? I'm not going to gain anything. But then I realized the bigger picture, you just want them to get this work ethic. If it's scooping ice cream, it's still a job. If it's, you know, waiting tables, you know, till eight o'clock at night, it's still a job. So uh, it did open up different things with the apprenticeship in regards to that, that, you know, when they're 17, they're able to do a little bit more under this law if it's with an apprenticeship. So it kind of piggybacked off each other there. They still can't operate a forklift. They still can't do a crane. They still can't go and weld something. If they're going to weld, it'll be with an apprenticeship. It'll be with somebody next to them and they'll be at a 17 year old level. Um, I I think a lot of people would probably faint if we handed a 14 year old um, (laughs) a piece of welding equipment or a remote control to a crane. Um, I mean, I'm well above 14 and I don't even want to be handed that without some supervision. So um, it definitely... I think we'll see it in the engineering side with, you know, 16 year olds coming in. Uh, We have plans for wiring jobs with uh, our IT department for next summer with 16, 17 year olds. So it's jobs like that, too, that, you know, give them that experience of having a job, that responsibility, and then exposing them to different things. Uh, And I want to come to Aaron on this, too. But real quick, Cassandra, just to kind of put a bow on all this. So it sounds like uh, if I heard you right, um, there's not while while you while you see some good things in there, you haven't seen a lot of impact yet on this, and, and primarily because businesses are still waiting for a little more clarity, a little more guidance on what is and what isn't allowed. Uh, yeah, they're definitely the you know when you read any law, it's confusing, but then when you read this and you're uh, putting 14, 15, 16 year olds in the workplace, you're definitely more hesitant to be the first one to say, hey, I hired a 15 year old. Uh, We don't have many employers standing in line to do that (laughs) right now, so. No, and and as I gotta say, as you say, if you read any law, it's confusing as a state house reporter, uh, uh, hallelujah. (laughs) Yes. Uh, Aaron, I I was wondering if you see any potential uh, benefits uh, or or maybe cause for concern in, in this, in this law, I don't know how much it might impact, you know, the public sector much. It's, it is interesting as I was trying to think through that here, Cassandra mentioned the one example that I had come up with uh, too of, of lifeguards, you know, maybe they can work a little later. Do you see this, this new law is impacting the public sector um, in any way, one way or the other? Yeah, I think there are potential impacts. I have to admit, I'm learning more and more about Mm -hmm. this through conversations like today. Um, And I knew I knew of the law and just enough to kind of the broad level. I know that there have been a lot of questions that have come to us to try to help answer, you know, can we have younger workers in these roles? What, What are the changes that were made in the law? And I think there's a lot of confusion out there still around what those are and what do the state and federal guidelines say and do they conflict and and so forth. And I definitely am not an expert in those details. So when the questions come in, I either send them to um, someone else on staff that knows a little bit more about this or we tell encourage them to check in with HR or their city attorney. So I, I probably wouldn't be able to answer much more than that, although I think um, the lifeguards idea is a good one, I, but I think there's even question there that we've heard from si- some cities that they're still unsure of whether or not this opens up more flexibilities with even seasonal work like that. So, yeah. And just to be uh, clear, when you say you're having questions come from in, you're talking from your members from city. From our membership, leaders, yeah, city, from, yeah. City employers that are looking to fill roles like yeah. you know, seasonal roles and, and others. Yeah. That's interesting. That's great. Yeah. All right. Uh, let's go. We did have, like I said, we had a couple of questions pop in. So let, let's shift to those now. And again, as a reminder, if anyone still had one uh, in our last few minutes here, uh, if you have a question, pop it in. We may have a chance to get to it. Um, our first one is from uh, Alex, it looks like. And uh, it, it could be for both of you. And 
Aaron, I think maybe we touched on this a little bit earlier with a question I had had, but uh, maybe you're able to expand on it, but, but I'll throw it out here. Um, and, and we'll start with you, Aaron, how do you each, this is the question from Alex, how do you each deal with the perceptions and realities of working in government uh, to you, Aaron, or, or in factories to you, Cassandra, um, and some of the maybe, uh, you know, pre um, existing opinions that people have about some of those jobs that may maybe feel that they're slow to hire, have low pay, um, or, or there's uh, only jobs for people in advance who are advanced in the career, not entry positions, et cetera, et cetera, all, all those kind of preconceived notions that people might have uh, about uh, some of the jobs in each of your industry. Uh, how do you address those? And, and Aaron, we'll start with you. You know, that's a tough question. I, I would say that because there are 940 cities in the state of Iowa, plus the 99 counties and, and other levels of local government, so you don't want to miss schools in the state, um, in there, everybody handles this a little bit differently. I mean, I, I, I know that those perceptions are out there of slow to higher, low pay, I think is what um, uh, what was in the question. Um, but everybody kind of handles that at a different pace. And there's a pretty broad variety of possible jobs out there, depending on what public sector employer um, that you're working with. So I think, again, some of the strategies would be uh, connecting with the younger populations, going out to the career fair to explain kind of what are out there, working with the technical colleges, community colleges, um, higher ed institutions here in our state also do a really great job of like, trying to explain what, um, what community development looks like, what does economic development look like, you know, are those of interest and connecting them with their programs and then some of the technical side. Um, so whether that's uh, public works operators or um, some of the uh, parks and recreation, um, what so trying to recruit maybe around some specific interests that people have um, out in the communities. And I think that goes to kind of um, just the diversity of cities, the roles that we're trying to fill, and then how quickly they can or or not recruit or um, their pay skills can match. We talked about that a little bit earlier with the rural versus urban. Sometimes it's a little bit easier for um, urban communities to compete for those difficult to, to fill roles as well. So. And Cassandra, I, I think you touched on this a little bit earlier. I remember you saying, you know, talking about uh, addressing the idea that manufacturing jobs are dirty and dingy and, 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 you know, getting through that kind of preconceived notion. So maybe you've touched on this all, all right a little bit, but it, if you could just kind of touch on that again, or if you have any way to expand. Yeah, I'd say that. just seeing is believing, you know, I had never worked in the manufacturing sector before. So I had no clue what to expect either. And uh, I definitely was never in Iowa before either. So I would joke, you know, they flew me out there and they're like, oh, we left the key in the car. It's at the airport parking lot. And I'm like, oh my gosh, like I'm going to be on a Lifetime movie. And, um, you know, then I fly in and I'm like, oh, I get it now. So I kind of had that aha moment too with the factory. Um I'll have that a lot when I'm recruiting um, like engineers. Like I have one that's in North Carolina right now that I'm like, oh, we'll, we'll fly you out. You'll have a tour. And they're like to Iowa in a factory. Like I, I don't need to do that. And I'm like, no, trust me, you'll be inspired. So that's probably the best way that I can say it is just try to figure out what would inspire your person. You know, it's not the 1940s anymore. It's completely different. Um, and I mean, I'm always brutally honest that it is hard work. You know, there's no doubt in anybody's mind that it's hard work, but there's something about seeing a product, touching it, and then you drive down the road and you're like, oh, hey, I put the panels on that grain bin or I painted the sukup name on that sign. So just having that sense of pride at the end of the day that your hand is what made a product really goes a long way. All right. Uh, one more question to get to, and then uh, we'll give some time. Uh, to both Cassandra and Aaron for any closing thoughts they may have uh, uh, on today. Uh, so we'll give you time to kind of be thinking about that here as we queue up this uh, next question. Uh, thank you uh, both of them for being here and thank you all for listening. Uh, one more quick question in, in the chat that comes from Casey and, and it comes from when we were talking about the 
issue of housing and, and Casey points out that, you know, we talked a lot about interest rates and, and the challenges there. And he points out the, uh, that there's also a backlog and, and uh, that sometimes it takes up to a year or even more if you're looking to build a house. So, so either to that specifically or, or maybe even broadly, Cassandra, just um, not just the cost of housing, but the availability of housing is an issue too, is it not? Oh, definitely. You know, I, I always thought in Iowa that if you bought a house, you got 10 acres for free. And uh, that is definitely wrong. You know, you're basically buying the land and the house is free. But the problem is there's just no houses and people that are in them are in them for the long haul or it's passed down through families, generational farming. And there's just no break of getting into, you know, that house. It's just passed on. So I've never seen anything like that before either, where houses may have never been on the market because it's just been in the family for years. So um, the inability to create new housing is a huge issue. All right. Uh, I think that uh, gets us close to the end here. Uh, some great questions. Thank you for those. And thank you all for listening uh, for the uh, last couple of minutes here. Uh, we'll give each of our guests, uh, our panelists, a, a chance to give whatever closing thoughts they may have. So, Aaron, let's let's start with start with you. Uh, just broadly speaking, in anything, uh, uh, any closing thoughts you had, anything that we covered today that you want to reemphasize, just any closing thoughts you might have on our discussion. Yeah, thank. Well, first of all, thank you for the opportunity. It's been fun to have this conversation and also hear. Um, you know, from both the public and private sector, um, some some ideas. I think for me, I've just been reflecting on the last the last hour on some of the things that make communities thrive. And I think I would just add that to the conversation around maybe when we talk about what does it look like to have a job in the public sector. And Cassandra, you mentioned seeing you know, what you see in the factory and bringing that away it gives you a whole different lens on what that job looked like. I think that's very true in the public sector as well, is, you know, you have this sense of community and pride that you are contributing and, and helping your community be, be a good or great place to live. So that that's kind of my thoughts and reflections on the hour. Perfect. Thank you, Erin. And, and Cassandra, I'll give you a, a little time here too for your closing thoughts. Yeah, I would say my main point that I'd want to drive home is just employers listen to your employees and, you know, work with them, see what their needs are. Um, and I wish more employers would work with other employers, too, uh, that we're all in the same boat together. The recruiting market is just insane and um, it's not getting any better. It's only getting worse. And whatever idea you have, just run it, see what happens. And, you know, there's really no dumb ideas at this point in the recruiting world. All right. Awesome. Well, I think that wraps it up for this session. I uh, want to thank sincerely both our panelists, Cassandra and Aaron, for being here. A great discussion and some, some great uh, ideas and uh, topics that we covered today. So I appreciate you both being here. Uh, thank you sincerely to the audience who joined us. We're, we're glad you were here. We hope it was worth your time. And again, a big thanks to our Iowa Ideas sponsor, ITC Midwest. And uh, for all of you still with us, be sure to come back tomorrow and join us for tomorrow's session, which is titled Keeping Education Vibrant in Rural Communities. Should be another great discussion. And I know we have a great panel for that one as well. And, and a reminder again, that all of our in-depth week sessions will be available for replay at iowaideas.com. So if you missed part of today's or you've heard us talking about some previous sessions, uh, make sure you catch those at the website. And speaking of iowaideas.com, also make sure you head there if you haven't yet to register for the full idea Iowa Ideas Conference, which is free and virtual and will take place this fall on October 12th and 13th. So definitely check us out then. A lot more great discussions to be had. So once again, thank you, Cassandra and Aaron, for being here. Thank you all for listening. Thank you and have a great day and stay cool out there.